Welcome to Wider Lens, a podcast brought to you by the Directors Guild of Canada in Ontario. I can't wait for you all to hear today's conversation, as I'll be chatting with the exceptional creatives behind Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. Production designer Tamara Deverell, costume designer Louis Sakara, and producer J. Miles Dale. All three nominated for Oscars at this year's Academy Awards. After working with Del Toro on multiple projects over the course of nearly two decades, Tamara, Luis, and Miles have developed a formidable creative brain trust. We're going to delve into the film's lush look and what it takes to shape a film as visually complex as Nightmare Alley. I think for Guillermo, the art department is sacred territory, and he's obviously such a visionary. He's really connected to the art department, so he it was his safe zone. Where they turn to for inspiration, I went to Spain, I went to Rome, I went to the UK, and I had, you know, an incredible array of costumes that were not really seen much in North American cinema. And what it means to be nominated for an Academy Award for their work on this film. To have the recognition of your peers in terms of these kinds of nominations, I think it's just a validation that your work is really good. I mean, I'm frankly very humbled by it. I'm Annie Bradley, and this is Wider Lens. Uh, All three of you are nominated for this year for Best Production Design, Best Costume Design, and Best Picture. And I think a lot of people uh, would like to know just about the origins of your working relationship with Guillermo and uh, how that all came to be. And maybe what I'll do is I'll start with Miles, because I think you were sort of the, the genesis of this all, and you brought this team together. Well, uh, yes, in a way, even though Tamara worked with Guillermo before I did uh, as an art director on Mimic, um, uh, Guillermo and I uh, have been working together for over 10 years. Uh, first on Mama, he was um, directing Pacific Rim at the time, and he needed someone to produce Mama. Uh, our good friend Edgar Wright uh, introduced us, um, and I did that film. Um, I brought Lewis onto that film, so that was his introduction to Guillermo. Lewis and I had been working together for a number of years prior to that, since we were both in diapers, really. Um, And uh, Tamara and I had been working uh, uh, together for a while as well at that point. Um, And then we got together um, on The Strain, the television show in 2013, where Tamara came back into Guillermo's fold and Lewis was on that as well. So that was really the beginning of the four of us working together. So we we have almost 10 years, the four of us. and then it continued through, you know, Shape of Water, which Lewis did, and now Nightmare Alley, um, uh, with the four of us again. So, you know, the beauty of that is that there's a real shorthand. I mean, we're we're all very fond of each other. Obviously, uh, the working relationships, the personalities, the taste, the expectations. Um, uh, you know, there's really something to that. You know, on 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 most films. You know, there'll be some new people and there'll be some new personalities. And it's like a bit of a chemistry project sometimes where you roll the dice on uh, 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 the fit of those temperaments and tastes and everything else. And um, with this group, uh, you know, we're past that now, which is kind of a lovely thing. As we all know, making movies is hard and making great movies is even harder. So uh, to have, uh, uh, you know, this group together and we just finished a very difficult anthology series for uh, uh, Netflix, where I, I really have to say, if not for Tamara and her group and Lewis and his group, w- you know, it would have been a disaster or even worse, possibly mediocre. So um, I feel like the time that we've got in together, uh, you know, has been wonderful and we've really built, you know, a, a great core together. It was a long time dream of Guillermo's to adapt the book Nightmare Alley, which the film is based on. And I wonder, Miles, if you could just talk about why was now the moment to bring Nightmare Alley to the screen? Well, um, Guillermo had wanted to do it for a long time. You may be familiar with the story, but Ron Perlman, when they were making Kronos, um, they wanted to do something together, you know, along the lines of Elmer Gantry with Ron in the lead. And Ron had suggested N- Nightmare Alley. Uh, and of course, they couldn't get the rights. Uh, Tyrone Powers Estate had it tied up. Uh, but Ron was going to play Stan Carlisle. So cut to 25 years later, uh, Guillermo and his new wife, Kim Morgan, talked about just writing something as an exercise. Uh, and it turned out they were both big fans of the book uh, and the original movie. 
And so they, they kind of just started writing it. So when he came to you um, with Nightmare Alley, what were your initial conversations like? Where did you begin? Um, I think mostly we looked at a lot of research together. You know, I, I mean, that's where I always start. And Guillermo is very good at, you know, doing his homework and looking, you know, drawing, drawing references and resources. And he'll refer to painters and other films and books and history. Uh, you know, so he brings a lot, obviously, to the fold. Um, he also, like, was buying props on <laughs> eBay for like he couldn't help himself he was buying straight edge razors and all kinds of things he really gets into it so um yeah i think our first sort of bit was just looking at images together and and when i say research i mean like curated research so i would find things that i thought guillermo would would that would speak to guillermo and show him and we'd have a bit of a dialogue and you know, our language is a very visual language. So we share images, we share sketches. He comes into the art department. He'll stand with me at the set designer's computers and go through things. We built little blocks for the carnival. Mark Kutenbrauer, our construction coordinator, before he even started, he, I said, can you just cut me some little, you know, toy blocks? And, you know, Guillermo and I played with that and tried to figure out the, the, the area of the carnival, how big it was going to be, what the relationships are going to be, like in a very preliminary fashion. In Nightmare Alley, there's these very two distinct worlds. There's a world that, you know, of the carnival, which is strangely a much more moral world, a, a world that has community and and sort of sort of has sort of a sense of, of purpose in it. Um, and then there's the world uptown. So can you talk a little bit about what those differences, you know, aesthetic differences were from his point of view and how you guys collaborated on creating the authenticity of those two worlds? Uh, well, I mean, it was really like working on two movies, uh, not, not surprisingly. Uh, the carnival was, you know, for me, I, you know, I think without talking about it too much, we wanted it to be very real uh, and very gritty and really like have the audience feel like they're walking into a carnival. Like that was our first approach. And then the embellishments of, of sort of the, the del Toro vision of it and, and Dan Lauschton's lighting, you know, and the costumes and everything that, you know, made it into our world, uh, sort of came out at the same time, but a little bit after figuring out what is, what is, a, what is it like to be walking into a carnival in the 1930s? And then for the high society art deco um, world, that was very much um, a different, you know, it's like being Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, one day you'd be a carny and the other day you'd be this high society wearing a full length gown and, you know, looking at all these glamorous and beautiful art deco locations. I mean, for that, you know, again, there was a lot of research and I wasn't just looking at art deco with Guillermo. We were looking at... Um, different paintings for composition and Hammershoy for some, actually for some of the earlier stuff, who's a Danish painter. And we were looking at Andrew Wyeth for, again, you know, for the country shack, like, you know, we're draw drawing from all sorts of different references. Um, I do want to say the art for the art deco side of it, lo the locations we found in both Toronto and Buffalo were really a big part of assisting me in the design process and vision like it was very helpful even locations that we walked into that we didn't shoot at were really there were things that Guillermo and I were seeing you know I have pictures of Miles in a telephone booth in the Hotel Lafayette in Buffalo where we didn't shoot but we built a booth like that I mean it was just you know it was great reference for us um collectively I'll need that photo and back you thank you <laughs> oh no it's, it, it's it's going on Twitter <laughs> And, it's a good one. And maybe, and, and maybe just talk a little bit about the authenticity in building that carnival world. Because I think a lot of times people, you know, we look at films like that and we think, oh, yeah, they've, you know, this is, there's a certain amount of visual effects happening here or there's a certain amount of, you know, they've built this in a studio, et cetera. But can you maybe just talk about how you built the carnival and what level of authenticity you went to in that regard? <laughs> I mean, we we pretty much built everything, but for the um, Ferris wheel and the the carousel, we found a good 30s, 1920s, 1930s carousel that we had to refurbish, uh, bring it back to the original look, and we added to it. Um, so it was really built from the ground up in a parking lot, in a 
grassy field parking lot. Like it was, there was nothing there. So, you know, we had to build all the tents, design all the tents. Uh, we had a great company in the Midwest of the States who'd been building, t you know, family business had been building tents for hundreds of years, really, the, the literally had built the Barnum and Bailey first uh, circus tents. And so they were extremely helpful. And we would, you know, we would do patches, we would dye patches, send them the fabric to build once we decided on the weight, and then send them the fabric, show, share the fabric with Lewis, the colors with Lewis, because it was very much a color palette, orchestrated piece of um, cinema, really, like all that back and forth, right, Lewis? So, you know, and and Absolutely. always with Guillermo, just finding that right tone. And then, uh, yeah, so we had the tents build, we aged them, we, you know, we put them up, we took them down, we put them up, we had a pandemic, our geek pit filled with water, but it was all real. You know, some of the sets we did, we did end up putting, moving the geek, or build, rebuilding portions of the geek pit in the studio for some of the shots that we could get, uh, the camera moving into the geek pit itself. Uh, we couldn't get that on location, even though it was physically dug into a ground with a sump pump and everything once it started to fill. Um, yeah, and and the fun house interior was built on stage, which was, uh, you know, our special effects team had to make it breathe, you know, like it was part, of, it was, nature had a big part of this because it blew through the carnival, like for real. And that's what I think made it so magical. Thank you, nature. All of the actors <laughs> said to me, actually, how much they appreciated that the carnival was, everything was in situ. So, you know, you would walk into that carnival and, you know, everything was where it was supposed to be and there was steam coming and you'd walk into those tents. And as Tamara said, you know, the first time we were there when the tents were up, you know, the, 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 the wind would blow through and the, the tents would be surging. It was like the, the heart and lungs of, of the carnival and it really came alive. So, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, a reality uh, and, and for the actors and everything, it was it was never something that could have been built in the studio with any kind of believability. Um, so it, it was really kind of a living, breathing thing. And I and and also too, let's not forget the rain, the constant rain, which, you know, I, which means mud, which is uh, melting clothes to field. Lewis. Is what it means, Lewis. <laughs> Lewis, you should Lewis, address. How the many rain. conversations did we have about rain? Where Lewis is saying, "I've got this oh stuff from God. the '30s, and as soon as the water hits it, it's going to turn into mush. It's going to fall <laughs> apart." That's yeah, a lot of negotiations with Guillermo yeah. about who got rained on and when, and how people would not show up to the carnival in the rain. We can have carnies there, but the townsfolk, no, no, they should not be there. And maybe that, uh, Luis, maybe you can talk about this with, uh, you know, the collaboration that goes back and forth, because part of the carnival world and part of, of course, world building is background, is characters, is, you know, wardrobe, et cetera, that lends to the, and builds the authenticity of the experience for the viewer. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about how Tamara and you worked on that hand in hand. You're talking about a palette of colors, et cetera. What was your approach to building the world of the carnival? Uh, well, at the beginning, we, we obviously did the same sort of thing as Tamara. We had uh, lots of imagery, uh, you know, five, uh, three inch binders of imagery um, that we, you know, looked through and, and curated and I curated boards to show Guillermo. And um, I really wanted to understand what was in his head for each world so that, um, you know, we could procure those those items and, and fall within within his vision. Um, Interestingly enough, that period was very popular and not available in North America. And Guillermo uh, had done a devil's backbone in, in Spain and said, why don't you go to Spain? And I said, I love that idea. So uh, we, uh, I went to Spain, I went to Rome, I went to uh, the UK, and uh, I had you know an incredible um, array of costumes that were not really seen much in North American cinema, which was kind of wonderful um, to pull and together and, and, and bring back to Toronto. Um, from the, those early meetings, it was about the color palette, the textures, the, the, the styling. Um, I mean, I've spoken to this before, but even though there's two years between the, the city and the country, we really wanted to create this, this chasm of worlds, um, early thirties for the carnival and on point 1941 for the city. Um, and then working with Tamara, of course, throughout the whole project, we, we were in constant contact, looking at colors, making sure that they, they blended without, 
you know, getting sandwiched in to each other, um, the importance of using sparingly red or, or derivatives of. Um, and then it was really about building those textures. And because of the rain, there were many budgets handed in for what about this? And what about that? And how about 50 people in the rain? And how about a hundred people? Anyway, uh, we, we built a lion's share of all those carnival clothes and then had to age them all um, because everyone had triples. They were re-wearing the same clothing for those, those couple of months. And um, so, you know, my incredible team, we took those clothes, we, we aged the cloth before we built it, we made the clothes, uh, turn, well, made costumes, turned them into clothes, and, uh, and then aged them back out again. And I think that in itself, I know the actors had spoken to me about how wonderful they felt in, in, in those um, costumes because they felt the age and the, the history. I've always said that great wardrobe for an actor is like the skin of a character. It's, it, it, you know, great wardrobe can change an actor's performance and elevate an actor's performance as well as, you know, diminish an actor's performance, as we well know. So, um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about what you and Guillermo talked about when you were trying to come up with these very distinct personalities that exist in the world of the carnival. Uh, yeah, so early early on, uh, by curating some of those images, uh, I, we zeroed in on some some uh, images that really spoke to each of the characters. Um, and from from there, uh, I started building some of those those pieces. Um, I think what's really important for me in a fitting, in your first fitting, obviously before that is is getting the feedback from those boards from from the actors. Um, to see how they feel about it, because obviously they're they're part of the process, and uh, it truly is collaborative that way. Um, but then when they come into the fitting and we start we start putting things on, it really kind of morphs. And the more comfortable an actor feels, the more successful your fitting's going to be. And I think what what I really wanted was um, those those costumes to become their clothing for them to not think about it, for them to just put put those pieces on, feel. Uh, like you know, feel like Zena, feel like Bruno, feel like whoever they they were they were playing. I have to say that Guillermo and Miles really understand the importance of having actors come in early. It is immensely uh, helpful to the process, and really, it, it's taking the direction obviously of Guillermo's, um, bringing what what I can bring to the table, having the actors weigh in, and, and then collectively it it all gets refined. And in the process, there are micro decisions that have to be made all the time. And I often say, as a costume designer, sometimes I'm really just a costume decider because there are so many little things that have to be decided in the meantime beyond the, the finished product. So there you go. There seems to be this fascination with circles. And I'm just wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about where that came from, why, why it was important, and, and how you incorporated that into the design. I'm laughing because I we that question came up the other day and I, you know, it felt very like we it was so intentional and and it was very intentional for Guillermo and, and but it was also very organic like it sort of became we did the geek pit and then it was Stan is caught in in a circle and it became this theme of of this and Guillermo loves to play with shapes in in design. And then it was sort of the game of where are we, where are we getting other circles in here? And we found the Carlu, uh, which is this beautiful where we did the club, and we it has this beautiful circle ceiling, and we built a big circular platform to bring us our actors up to the ceiling. And so there it was again. And then the actual Carlu itself, which is this beautifully uh, beautiful deco. Uh, res lovingly restored uh, location in Toronto. You know, it had circle windows, so we played with that, and then we went back to the carnival at the end where there was a circle window in the last carnival trailer where Bradley Cooper says his his final line. And so it became like this big theme, and it was just like, I just kept putting them in, like wherever we could find them. And, it, you know, and Shane View, our amazing set decorator, it, there's a circle thing here, there's a circle thing there. And there was other shapes that we were playing with as well, like arches, which Guillermo loves to put arches. And, you know, some places we just went in as is some locations. And all I would do is add an arch. And we, we did that a couple of times in some of the older carnival period locations and some of the uh, 
you know, big city, big lights locations. Um, so yeah, we just played around with, with that circle theme. But to me, you know, I was always thinking of Stan is just in a circle. Like he's, he, he starts where he, he ends where he starts. He ends where he starts. He, he doesn't really evolve. He is, he's a shyster or he's a, he's, he is sinned. He's whatever you want to think about that character. He starts that way and he ends that way. I think with Guillermo, these shapes are, are, are again, very intentional. Uh, and it's just like Lilith's office is also an alley. You know, there, there are, there are two shape, two major thematic shapes. One is a circle and the other is the alley. So Stan is either in a circle or in a nightmare alley. And, and so, you know, every, everything goes to character and to story and Stan, you know, we see him, you talk about the transition of the world. It's the first time we see him in 1941, when we get to the Copa, we, theoretically, he's at the top of the world. He's, he's looking good. He's got the girl, he's selling out. You know, he left the carnival happy with Molly. We see him in, in Buffalo. He's not happy. You know, nothing will make him happy. And so really and truly the film is is a character study and it's it's uh you you talk about those themes and it's uh and that's why we didn't have stan speak for the first 10 minutes of the movie so the audience is being pulled along with him and 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 he becomes an avatar for the audience and and ultimately i think the the big statement is that but for a couple of bad decisions in your life you could be stan so you better decide where you stand on truth and lies because really anybody who takes the wrong fork in the road or two, you could end up there. So that in that way, it's kind of a cautionary tale and all the things that we do and Tamara does and Lewis does and, uh, you know, uh, and Lewis could talk about that, how, how uh, Bradley's wardrobe was, was uh, 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 there to support that. It, it all goes to story and character. Um, Luis, maybe you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the character work that you did with Bradley um, in, you know, redefining him as he moves th into this other world and he thinks more highly of himself, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, again, in those initial fittings with, with Bradley and putting those pieces together, um, we spoke about the, the difference in fit for uh, Stan, the beginning and, and Stanton, the city. And uh, part of, part of the um, thought was to, hide his physique in in the carnival and as he grew uh more powerful by by means of his his uh manipulative ways he would um the clothing would start to come together uh closer to his body so that when we saw him in the city everything was impeccably fit um and uh that was really the core of of um creating these two these two um sides of of um stanton uh, and conversely, at the end, he's, you know, completely um, swallowed by by his uh, his costume at the end of the, the picture um, for the city. What was wonderful is I had this opportunity to um, to get real 1939 suits that had never been worn. They were they still had government uh, stamps um, from the UK and they were gifted uh, to me on loan. And my tailor um, and I took a look at them. We we pulled the uh, f the the pattern away, and we created these these blocks for uh, Bradley. So the preciseness of fit and was was key for me. Um, and in regards to to Kate, again, it was looking at really specific details of that period, and not just the period, but those specific years um, from from Paris sketchbooks. And picking out those details that we're going to say this is 1940, 1941, mm -hmm. and and then trying to you know with with Stan giving him a nouveau riche edge, so even though the fabrics were you know beautiful and luxurious, there was still an edge to him that was speaking to his his newfound money as opposed to the other characters that were were old money, um, and that was incorporated with with some strong colors of shirts and and some what one would say loud ties in comparison, uh, but they were still pretty juicy period ties. Um, and, and really it was, is doing that is, is creating this arc for, for, uh, that character. So, uh, Tamara, I just want to ask you about the office, Dr. Lilith's office and where, where did, I mean, it's, it's, it's a character under itself. Obviously, 
there's so many elements in that office that are very, you you know, the buttons under the tables, the hidden recording device, the, the key in the lock, like so many beautiful things that speak to the control that that doctor has over her patients, over her who is trying to exert, I think, over her life. Um, maybe you could just talk about the ideas behind the design of that office, where it came from. There was a specific couple of uh, places I looked at. There's one in the Brooklyn Museum. There's a little um, study that they've transplanted by Parisian designers that they put in there. It was, it was in a house in, in Manhattan, and it's called the Wild Wargat Study, and it's on their design floor, and it's their Art Deco sort of room and I showed that to Guillermo and I said look this is beautiful it's all inlaid wood and uh, it's all of veneer I spoke to the curators I found out more about it. it had lacquer panels it had large windows but like literally I'd go to the museum I'd been going to the museum for years because my brother lives down the block and I'd be pressed against this the glass of this little room and and going like I love this I want to build this one day so it was in my head for a long time and Lilith when Lilith came up in the script I was like bingo um and I was also looking at there's a another place in, in England called the Eltham Palace which is all inlaid wood so wood it kind of became crucial like it became sort of the theme for her office and then we had a big to do about what we were going to do with the floor whether it was going to be marble or carpeting which a lot of the art deco rooms like that would have been carpeted certainly our sample room in the Brooklyn Museum was carpeted we ended up going with real marble floors which I think just the click clack of our heels on yeah on on that marble and all the scenes that had to play down there and the re reflections that Dan Lauschton was able to get and uh and actually, you know, mar doing using real marble in many ways is is cheap. I know it, you go, wow, real marble, but really, it's cheaper than tr us trying to replicate it. You know, as as excellent as our scenics are, you just there's nothing like the real thing. And we actually used it on the strain in uh, one of our big office sets there. That was the first time I used real marble, and I was like, you know, Guillermo, remember Miles, remember when we did that and how successful it was. So. Um, yeah, and so you know, it was that was a you know a complicated build in so many ways. Like just the carpenters, I think we drove them crazy with all the little gags and things that had to open and slide perfectly. You know, you don't you don't want the actress to be going like this with the door. So like you know, I drove everybody crazy going down every day, twice a day, open. No, a little smoother, a little shave off here, a little. But um, I, we you know we have amazing carpenters in Toronto, and they really excelled with this. So yeah. And it, also, too, you used a local, uh, the RC plant, the RC water plant, right? The That's Harris plant, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that because it was quite extraordinary when you when you walked into it. Did you build inside of that plant? Uh, we built, uh, so Guillermo knew that plant from way back on Mimic was actually yeah. coincidentally the first day we shot on Nightmare Alley, we shot there. And the first day we shot on Mimic, we shot there as well. And the inside, we used it as a hospital in Mimic. And so he knew about it. And he, like there was, I don't even think, Miles, we had a conversation about it. We just knew we were going to use that for Grindles. It wasn't, well, we didn't even yeah, need to talk you, about you, it. It was like, you, oh, We had yeah, a conversation and then I had to we call Mayor Tory <laughs> because nobody had shot there <laughs> since 9-11. <laughs> uh, you know, they shut it all down. I think yeah. John Carpenter was the last guy to shoot mm -hmm. there and it had to go to city council and we, we were we were on bended knee so it's not you guys may have waved your hand around and then i had to go do some work uh so they, they we were the we were the, the first uh, film to shoot there in, in 20 years and and that was pretty remarkable unto itself i mean it's a an amazing Inside there yeah facility and i mean a, an art deco jewel uh and then of course you built um grindle's office um uh to match that but yeah Obviously, uh, Guillermo has uh, been with us now in Ontario for quite some time, and maybe um, we just love to talk about, you know, it's obviously a difficult business, the film business, and now, of course, you know, in the last couple of years has become even more difficult. Obviously, you had to stop for six months with the pandemic, and uh, Guillermo's films are very involved and very intensive. Um what keeps you coming back to to his films and and this industry in general? Oh, I mean, it, 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 having the chance to work with Guillermo, why would you want to do anything else? I mean, I've said this before. If I die not having worked with another filmmaker, I will die happy. You know, uh, 
it's a great experience. Like I said, you, you know, he knows what he wants. It's always inspired. Uh, uh, he's smart. He's a gentleman. He's loyal. Um, he's funny. Uh, you know, we've all dealt with people uh, who are not that, who are who are none of that. And uh, this is just such a pleasure. So, look, I, I feel like he's brought your industry has been growing for you know, 40 years now, let's say. And it used to be that, you know, all the DPs and designers and costume designers came to town and we worked as their assistants. And now, you know, we're there, you know, Ontario and Canadian filmmakers, you know, we're proudly, you know, standing amongst the top filmmakers in the world. And I think that's an amazing thing. And now we're teaching the next generation of those people. So, you know, mentors like Guillermo are critically important to that process. The fact that he, you know, we fluked out and he made his home here for 10 years. It's, it's such a beautiful thing because so many people have had the opportunity to, you know, benefit from that and, 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 and see that great taste and wisdom and vision. And so, I mean, I think we all consider ourselves, consider ourselves incredibly fortunate uh, to have been uh, on that ride and to continue to be on that ride. So, I mean, for my part, um, uh, I, I couldn't be happier with where we are right now. In in my life, uh, I think all of us have these these people that one meets and they, they change your trajectory. And I would say that, number one, Miles, you know, you can leave the room for a minute, Miles. Uh, Miles is one of those people that I met in 1986. And uh, I was a, a wardrobe PA having been a... Co uh, uh, clothing designer, uh, but I started as a as a PA or trainee actually, not even PA as a trainee, and and you know uh, that dedication and and uh, kind of uh, passion for for filmmaking that I uh, that I found when I walked onto the first set of uh, Friday the Thirteenth, the series, and uh, and took it from there, and and I think Guillermo is obviously the other person that. I would not be here with without having met him and worked with him. So I'm, I'm eternally grateful for for that. And and what Guillermo does bring are those pearls of wisdom. I think the one thing that that stands out for me that he has said to me that I've taken every day I work is um, he mentions we could have a beautiful, amazing set, but the minute we go into a close up. We're no longer looking at that set. We're looking at the collar. We're looking at the design elements that surround that actor's face. So we're looking at that side. We're looking at the back. We're looking at the front. Um, and so, you know, make sure that, that, you know, you have those design elements in play. And in fact, for me now, that changed the way I take fitting photos. I take 360s on some occasions. If it is a true design thing like a monster or a, a ghoul or something of that nature, I will put them on a turntable and then I will do a 360 um, and then be able to study and, and finesse design wise for that. And I, that really, to me, is, is one of the most important ones. And then really it's, it's creating these almost action figure you know, every character should have the quintessential action figure look so that we can we can identify with each of those characters in our story. Um, you know, amongst all those other beautiful things of color and palette and and tone and tonality. Uh, those are the two things that that sit with me to this day. Uh, collab collaboration. Uh, and he I think he himself is very much about collaboration especially now i think he's gone through a transformation in the last few years where i think he he really trusts people rate you know puts the bar way up here and allows you to to go to that height um you know he's a visionary but he also you know miles you you downplay yourself because you're also a visionary as as a producer and i think that's so vitally important that you're not just you're not just talking about you know miles isn't just about money and this and schedule like like you get the filmmaking process you're a storyteller and i think that working you know with with miles and guillermo and lewis and dan laushkin and our, our decorator shane view and all the rest of the crew you know it really this whole idea of being a team and being together and and sharing ideas and lifting each other up is really you know that's what attracted me to the film industry in the first place as a young kid and 
that's what we've been living through now. Like it's really true. Like it's like your, you know, your Disney Disney World dreams come true, uh, kind of moment. But it is like that working, you know. And it's hard. It is hard work, and we all do work hard. And I think uh, we appreciate each other because of that. Well, I think that that level of excellence across all crafts on this movie is evident. Um, And I really would like to just wrap this up with one final question. You're all nominated for an Oscar. Um, What does that mean to you? What does that mean to you at this moment in your life? Miles? Well, for our part, I think it's just um, any good film is hard work. And uh, to have the recognition of your peers in terms of these kinds of nominations, uh, I think it's just a validation that your work is really good, um, that your, your movie has landed, uh, it resonates with people. Uh, and, and so to us, you know, at the very highest level, uh, uh, it, it's just nice to know that our peers have said, you know, you, you, you're now a part of the club uh, 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 that, you know, I, 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 me personally, and I don't know about these guys, if you had asked me 15 or 20 years ago, if, if I could ever be here, I, I wouldn't have even dreamed of it. And so to me, it's really just a, a dream come true that I'm able to, uh, uh, a, uh, a pride in our local community, having been, you know, I'm old. So uh, having having grown up through all of this uh, to see, you know, where we've come uh, and how we've learned at the feet of the masters and now and now, you know, to be in that league, uh, it's a source of immense pride. So uh, I, I think that recognition is great uh, because it's it, it does not come easily and and it's an honor. I mean, I'm frankly very humbled by it. Luis, I mean, this is your second nomination, correct? It is. Yes. Crazy. Completely crazy. Uh, I, I have to echo Miles' sentiment. I mean, the, you are, you are uh, brought forward by your peers. You're brought forward by other costume designers in my case. Um, and this year was such an amazing, stellar year of design. Uh, f- you know, films that were not as uh, popular, but incredible work. Um, other films that obviously uh, are are remarkable, um, and so to find to find a place at the table, so to speak, uh, I am truly humbled and and thankful that the work um, resonated with with my fellow um, designers that they were able to see the you know the preciseness, the 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 care for detail, the 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 world building, um, and uh, so I, I couldn't be happier. You know, people. The number one question, oh, do you think you're going to win? It's like, it's not a, really, it's not about winning. Um, I am so incredibly uh, uh, humbled to be just a, a nominee amongst those those folks. And Tamara? Well, you know, <laughs> starting this film, I was not expecting all of this. You know, you just, you just kind of put your head down and you, you know, every day I was just trying to do the best visually I could and with a fantastic team and with just like working together, working in sync and like putting, you know, putting together, a, a you know, an art department that is so in sync with each other, you know, I didn't really have time to, I've never, I, I never took time to think, oh, we could win some awards with this. Like, this is looking really good. I felt in my heart that it was looking really good. And I felt that we were all doing to the best of our ability with Guillermo as our key visionary. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's humbling to the utmost. And having just won this award last night, I was like, oh my God, I'm like, my first thank you was to the other nominees for these incredible worlds. And and I guess we did the same thing. And it was like, it's just really uh, a pleasure and an honor in the biggest way. You know, it's the dream come true. I can't begin to tell you how proud we all are of all of you and the entire teams that you have uh, working with you. Um, we are behind you 100% all the way. And I agree with you, whether you win or not, um, being nominated in such a a talented field this year is truly an honor for for all of us. Um, And we are 
excited for you and for the next journey and for the, you know, the projects that are to come. Uh, we wish you the very best with that. And I'd like to thank you on behalf of DGC Ontario and Wider Lens for joining us today and uh, being a part of uh, the exploration of craft and the celebration of excellence. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thanks. This podcast was produced by Katie Jensen and Michal Stein at Vocal Fry Studios. Our video producer is John Pakman. Our executive producer is Anne-Marie Stewart. And special thanks to Aviva Cohen and Laura DiGiralamo at DGC Ontario. And I'm your host, Annie Bradley. We'll see you next time on Wider Lens. 